So, three games that pass the Kalos test. Boom, da. You may be wondering, what exactly is the Kalos test? Well, the Kalos, of course, I'm referring to this. A game that came out in the mid-2000s and got a huge amount of interest when it came out. Shot rapidly up the board game geek table. People thought it might even achieve the impossible and knock Puerto Rico off the number one spot. It didn't quite do that, but what it did do was influence games considerably. And that was because it was the first popular game to use a worker placement mechanism. Now, it wasn't the very first game to use worker placement, and there's various arguments about who was the first game to use worker placement, but it was the first game that got a lot of popularity. Now, I played Kalos pretty much when it first came out, so it was the first game I played that used worker placement. And since then, I have played many, 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 many games with a used worker placement mechanism. And every time I play a game that uses worker placement, there's always this little voice in the back of my head saying, Wouldn't you rather be playing Kalos? Playing Kalos? Playing Kalos? And that's the Kalos test. When I'm playing a worker placement game, would I rather be playing Kalos? And it's a tricky test because Kalos is a very good game. And it may be an old game, but it's still solid. So what I'm going to talk about here is three games that have actually passed that test. But before I talk about the three games, it's worth saying a little bit about what makes Kalos such a good game. These days, when people talk about worker placement games, they often talk about it in terms of multiplayer, solitaire, don't have a lot of interaction, sort of complex action selection mechanisms, lots and lots of things that you might be able to do. Kalos is really quite different. For a start, it's a very tight game. Resources are very difficult to obtain. The actions you need to take put a great deal of care in the planning the right sequence together. And it's a very interactive game. Um, other people are placing tiles on the board. What are they trying to do with those tiles? Do I want to get in there first. Even the act of passing is deeply interactive because in Kalos you start with a bunch of workers, it just it costs you denier to use each worker when you play it. But when somebody passes that cost goes up and so not just are you trying to get your workers in before other people grab the same spots, you're also worried about can I get my workers in before the price goes up and I can no longer afford to place workers. And that's not even mentioning the Provost. The Provost is the single most hated piece of wood in board Gaming. But if you don't hate the Provost when you're playing Kalos, your opponents aren't playing properly. So the first game that passes the Kalos test, first of the three, is this one. Agricola. Agricola came out just a year or so after Kalos. It achieved what Kalos failed to achieve. It did knock Puerto Rico off the number one spot. And that's because Agricola is Kind of rather like Kalos, a really good game. Like Kalos, it, there is not a huge amount of room of, for luck and randomness, although there is more so. Kalos has pretty much no randomness at all, other than a tiny amount of setup randomness. It's a pure information game. Agricola does have a little bit more, but it's still very much a skill-based game. Agricola is different in a number of other ways as well. In Kalos, most of the worker placement spots that you put out are put out by the players during the game. So each game has quite a different layout of worker placement spots. Agricola is much more Type. It's got a much more defined set, a much more predictable set of spots that you might want to use. There's also in Agricola quite a lot of action on your player board as you build up your little farm, uh, plant your vegetables, fence in your, your sheep paddies and whatever. While in Kalos doesn't have any kind of player board at all, all the action occurs on the shared board. So Agricola is quite important in one of the senses that it influenced a lot of modern board gaming into having these most of the action occur on individual player boards rather than on, on the shared board. But the interactivity of the actions on those worker placement spots on the shared board is still very much the case. There's a lot of replanning you have to do when you try to decide which actions you want to take, which actions then get blocked by other players, how are you going to react to them. Another big difference with Agricola, you start with only two workers, which is not enough to be able to do what you want to do. The most important thing you have to do in Agricola is plan to get more workers. Family growth. A few rounds into the game, you've got to make enough room in your farm to be able to accommodate the third worker and then go for that action spot. Getting more workers is a crucial part of Agricola because it allows you to do more and it also scores a lot of points. Now that's quite different to Kalos, where you have all the workers you ever need, you just don't have enough money to pay them. This is a very early version of Agricola, if you might re recognize it. In fact, it's so early that uh, my sheep are uh, actually these cubes. This is a sufficiently old game, but it doesn't even have any meatballs. But it is a great game. And one of the nicest things about this game is the drafting mechanism for the cards, the special actions 
minor improvements in occupation. That means at the beginning of the game, you have to create your whole strategy to be able to succeed with the game. So Agricola, I'm always happy to play this and I'm not worried about comparing it to Chaos. The second game I mentioned that passes the Careless Test is really quite different. Viticulture. I see this as really quite a different game to Agricola because of the fact that Agricola, like Kalos, is a very skillful, intense game. Viticulture is much more relaxed. There's a lot more randomness involved. Pulling cards has a lot to do with how things will work out. There isn't the same intensity over the action selection spots. Each of the worker placement spots has a number of slots available. Blocking does happen, but it's much rarer. And you also got the one special worker, the Grande Worker, which can completely ignore all of the worker placement blocking rules, allowing you to carry out at least one action that you really need to do. So there's a lot less intensity, a lot less room for that terrible Tearing your hair out sense of can I get the actions that I need to get in order to play. And so Viticulture is really a game for a different mood. One of the things about comparing games is that you have to compare them in context. There are many contexts which I would never want to pick Viticulture over Caleb. It depends on who I'm playing with and what our mood is. I know people who I like gaming with who never want to play a game as intense as Caleb's and Agricola but they love the re more relaxed style of gaming and viticulture. If I want to hang out and game with them, I'm going to pick a game like this. Sometimes even with people who enjoy Kalos, we're not really in the mood for an intense brain burning workout. We want something a bit more relaxed, a bit more straightforward. That's when viticulture comes into play. The rules are fairly straightforward. It's not a complicated game. The flow of the actions is fairly straightforward. It uses a winemaking theme. You plant grapes, you harvest grapes, you make wine, put the wine in cellars, and then you sell the wine um, to other, to, uh, in contracts. It's a very straightforward flow. It's an easy game to understand. There's not a lot of complexity in trying to figure out what you need to do. You just want to do it as quickly as possible. And there is always somebody who's going for what I refer to as the Finger Lakes option in this. I should explain what I mean by the Finger Lakes strategy. This was inspired by a trip that uh, my wife and I took uh, about 10 years ago to the Finger Lakes area in upstate New York. Uh, we got up there and we found there was a lot of wineries. So we thought, oh, let's go along to a winery. And we showed up at the winery and there was this, this big scene with lots and lots of people, not a quiet tasting exercise at all, but a big crowd. And we looked at the, the wines and we tried some of the wines and they were awful. They were sweet red wines, the kind of stuff that we would never normally touch. But the place was absolutely hopping. Every couple of minutes, a new stretch limo would pop up outside and a bunch of students would sort of stagger out of the stretch limo and go in and party at the place. So the Finger Lakes to me, means not so much wine that you want to drink, but a party location. And that's a strategy in viticulture. You don't really make very much wine, you just set up your tasting room and score victory points from all sorts of different uh, ways that have nothing to do with making wine at all. But if you execute that strategy, you can win because you can get to the point thresholds faster than anybody else before they get their winemaking engines going. So that's the thing with viticulture. The aim of the game is supposedly to make wine, but you've got to do it quickly enough that you can get there before the, the party animals. But all in all, that's part of what makes the game so much fun. There's various different things that you can do. It's not super stressful. It's a much more relaxed game. A good game to play, in fact, while drinking wine. And drinking wine while playing a nice board game is one of the great pleasures of life. So that's two of the three games that passed the Kalos test. For the third game, I really have to think about the number three, because this is a game that makes a lot about the number three. It's in the title. Three Kingdoms Redux. Probably the least known of the three games, and it is an awkward game in many ways. In particular, talking about the number three, it only plays three people. It does not play two people. It does not play four people. Five is right out. This is a game for three. But it is also one of the best games I have. Therefore, a game I'll always want to play with three people. Very thematic. Rather like how Viticulture succeeds because of its lovely winemaking theme, one of the great qualities of this game is its theme and setting. Um, the Three Kingdoms is a well-known piece of Chinese literature. It has a similar relationship to the Chinese-speaking world that Shakespeare has to the English-speaking world. The Romance of the Three Kingdoms is just a classic book written in the 13-1400s in the Ming Dynasty. It's a historical novel based on events that took place hundreds of years earlier. The empire at the time began to fail and three kingdoms battled to replace it. So lots of people are going to be very familiar with much of the setting and theme of the game. And the players play those three kingdoms, battling for control of China. It is a worker placement game. It does three things that are very interesting and different. The first thing that it does 
is that your workers all have a numeric power value associated with them. So if I want to do a particular action, I can put a two power general on that spot. And if another player wants to do that more than me, they might put a three power general. Then I have to decide, do I really want to do this action? In which case I could put another two power general on the spot to get my power up level up to four, and then I'll be able to take the action. Or do I really want to do something else and therefore I have to put that general elsewhere? This setting of almost like a mini auction for each worker placement spot is the first interesting twist that it does on worker place. The second inter interesting twist that it takes is that these generals are not just anonymous pieces of wood. They are characters in their own right. They are actually all named characters from the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. When I say they have a power value, they actually have two power values. One for military spots and one for administrative spots. So you have to decide which mix of military and administrative work that you want to do in your round. On top of that, each general has a special power something that connects to the role in the story of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. So as you look at your set of generals, you're thinking, well, how do I best combine these generals in order to do what I want to do? And each time you play, this decision is going to be quite different. You have quite a large set of generals that you could take from, but you'll only use a few of them in each game. So every time you play the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, you get your hand of generals, you've got to decide which ones can I combine in a way that will work for me. The fact that you have your workers be very individual and different is the second interesting variation on worker placement that this game has. And then the final one has to do with this gaining workers. I, I mentioned in Agricola how gaining new workers, family growth, was such an important part of the game. It's also important in viticulture. Training new workers is one of the first things that you try to do so that you can get more worker placement spots. In Free Kingdoms, you actually lose workers during the game. One of the things that you want to do in Free Kingdoms is effectively station your armies in provinces because stationing an army will gain you a, a lot of victory points. But in order to station an army, you have to send a general to lead that army, losing your worker. So you're faced with this decision. Do I want to get the victory points from stationing an army? Or do I want to retain the general so that I can do more in the next round? That choice of whether to lose a worker or not is the third interesting factor that makes Three Kingdoms such a good game. It is a tricky game to get to the table. It's a heavy game. The rules are quite complex. And the strategy is definitely quite complex and you can only play it with three. Did I mention? This is a free play game only. But it is a really worthwhile one. But here's the third game that passes the Kalos test for me.